Ken Whiting with Paddle TV and in this video we're talking all about paddles to help you choose the right paddle or to simply inform you about all the different options that are available with paddles so when the time comes to either get your first paddle or upgrade your paddle, you know what's available. How much is there really to talk about paddles? Well, we could talk about high angle paddles, low angle paddles, aluminum paddles, fiberglass paddles, carbon paddles, straight shaft paddles, bent shaft paddles, telescoping paddles, beautiful paddles, crappy paddles, Greenland paddles, two piece paddles, four piece paddles, cheap paddles, expensive paddles, nylon paddles, paddles with twist, backup paddles, and broken paddles. Now, as a general overview, there are three types of paddles to talk about. You've got whitewater paddles. Now, whitewater paddles are designed for power and durability for obvious reasons. They range in length from 190 centimeters to around 204 centimeters. All you Americans out there, if you want to know what that is in inches, well, I'm not going to give it to you because paddles are measured in centimeters and maybe you should consider this your first step towards a practical metric system. The next style of paddle is a recreational or touring kayak paddle. Now, recreational or touring kayak paddles, I've got two different types here. They typically range from 210 centimeters to 250, sometimes 260 uh, centimeters in length. The two styles I have here, this is what's called a more of a typical kayak paddle. It's called a Euro style blade. And then this one here, is a Greenland paddle. It's a more of a specialty touring blade. First, let's start with the idea behind the Greenland paddle because most people haven't seen this before. A Greenland paddle is designed to spread the catch where you're catching water during your stroke over a long surface area. Whereas a Euro style blade catches the water at the end of your stroke. Now you get more leverage at the end of your stroke, but the trade-off is with a long surface area like the Greenland paddle, it's spreading the load more. And so there isn't the same jarring impact. Not, not that it's that jarring with the Euro style paddle, but it's less impact on the body. And so this uh, Greenland paddle is designed for long paddles, long tours. It's easier on the body, easier on the arms and body. I've been paddling with a Euro style blade for 30 years and I've only started to try and play with the Greenland paddle over the past two years. And what I can tell you is that the Greenland paddle does what it's supposed to do. It makes paddling for a long day over a long distance easier on the body uh, and the arms. But it's one of those paddles also that I feel like I need to commit to it. It does require a different paddling technique and I just don't do enough of that type of paddling to make a full commitment to this paddle. So I'm bouncing back and forth from your style to Greenland paddle. And it's actually fun, but it's a little confusing. <laughs> but we're gonna talk more now about choosing the right Euro style of blade because this is the most common type of paddle and the one you're most likely to start with. Now, before I get into Euro style blades in any more depth. A quick note, if you haven't already heard about the ACA's online safety course and haven't done it yet, well, this is a quick reminder about it. It's a free online safety course. At least it's free for now. It's not always gonna be free. You can go to, the, I'll leave a link in the description box down below. It's a fun online course. You do on your own convenience and it, really arms you with the information that can make an enormous difference in your life and the life of your loved ones. Because even though paddling is very safe, when things do go wrong, things have the potential of going very wrong. And it's usually just a little bit of knowledge that can make the difference between a happy ending and a disastrous outcome. So go take the ACA online safety course. So right into it, Euro style blades. Now the first thing we're gonna talk about with Euro style blades is the blade shape. Now you really you have two, two styles of blade shapes. You have a high angle stroke blade shape and a low angle stroke blade shape. And what that means, this big blade, this fat shorter blade is what we call a high angle blade shape. And the reason for that is when I take a stroke, it's gonna be more of a, a vertical stroke and I'm digging 
that blade, that full blade in the water, more alongside the kayak. It's the blade, my top hand is higher as I take that stroke. It's a more aggressive stroke. It's a more aggressive blade. You're catching more water with that, with that, uh, that stroke. Now, the flip side is with a low angle stroke, this is designed for lower angle, more relaxed paddling. It's a longer, sleeker blade shape, and you're reaching out more on, on the water with every stroke that you take. It's a less aggressive stroke, and because of the angle of your paddle, it's longer so that to get more of the blade in the water and to, to really reduce, much like a Greenland paddle, reduce the the amount of catch you get at the far end of your stroke. It's designed for a long day of paddling or for people who really just, they don't want that much power. They rather have a nice relaxing day of paddling. Now, when it comes to blade materials, there are four real options ranging from least expensive to most expensive. And obviously with that, the performance increases. Now we'll start with nylon blades. Now, nylon blades, basically plastic blades, these are the cheapest, uh, least expensive blades. And the reason for that is they're, they tend to be quite flexible. That means very low performing. You lose so much of the power of your stroke to the flex in the blade. They're moderately durable. You can bang these on rocks pretty good, but um, usually nylon blades are married with cheap shafts and so overall you have um, you know a very low performing blade. Now the next step up from nylon blades is reinforced nylon blades and I've got two here. These blades are plastic blades, nylon blades, that are reinforced with fiberglass in this case and carbon in this case. Now what the reinforcement with fiberglass and carbon does is it provides a lot more stiffness in the blade, it provides more durability. It's a still a relatively inexpensive paddle, but that performs much better than a straight nylon blade. Now the next step up from nylon or reinforced nylon blades is fiberglass blades. Now fiberglass is very light, it's very stiff. It feels great. It performs great. It's not as durable as reinforced nylon blades. And so that's the trade-off. Um, and it is a little bit more expensive than reinforced nylon blades, but it is significantly lighter and feels really nice to paddle with. Now that brings us to the last blade material, carbon. Ooh, that's a nice paddle blade. These carbon blades are, they're thin, they're light, they're stiff, so you get great performance, and they're remarkably durable, although you certainly have to take more care of them than you do with a reinforced nylon blade. Now, the trade-off, of course, is that they're the most expensive. So now let's talk about paddle shafts. And there are three types of materials that paddle shafts are made from. The least expensive is aluminum, like this one right here. Now, it is the least expensive, which is nice, but the downside is aluminum shafts are significantly heavier and they have more flex. They don't do a great job of transferring your power into propulsion. And so that's the trade-off. Now the next two materials that paddle shafts are made of uh, include fiberglass and carbon. Now this is a carbon shaft here. Um, the joy of fiberglass and both fiberglass and carbon is that they are lighter and stiffer than aluminum paddles. Carbon, of course, is the lightest and the stiffest and so that's why it's the most expensive, but both are good upgrades from an aluminum shaft. So next up, let's talk about a paddle's ferrule system. And what's a ferrule? Well, a ferrule is just a fancy name for the connection point on a two-piece paddle. Now, m most paddles come as two-piece paddles now because they're just so much more convenient for transportation. And the connection point, the ferrule, differs depending on what brand of paddle you're choosing. And even within a brand, there are really three types of common ferrules you'll see. Now, the most basic type of ferrule system you'll see is a simple snap button ferrule system. You've got a single 
snap button snaps into place and now the paddle is together, locked together. The good thing about a snap button ferrule system is its simplicity, but uh, more so it's cheap. It's a cheaper connection point. So if, if cost is your biggest issue, then this is a good solution. The downside of a snap button ferrule system, there's a couple. One is they can't have drill a hundred holes in here or else the paddle wouldn't have any stru structural integrity. So in this case, there's really three holes. That means this paddle can be set in three different feather or twist positions. It can either be around, I'd say around 60 degrees and this is zero and then this is 60 degrees for a left-handed paddler. We'll talk about twist later on. Uh, it's not infinitely uh, adjustable. The other downside is these snap button ferrules have a nasty habit of getting messed up or even getting locked into place, especially if you're paddling around salt water. Salt water can cause havoc on these. The other thing is there's a little bit of play. They're just not great connections. There's always a little bit of play. And so when you're paddling, you notice that a little bit. It's not a lot, but it's enough to be a little annoying. Now, the second type of ferrule system we're going to look at is a locking ferrule. Now, a locking ferrule system is designed to reduce the amount of play or completely eliminate the amount of play a kayak paddle has at the ferrule. Uh, the other thing that it does is it typically provides a lot more options for twist. You can go from anywhere, anywhere from zero to 60 degrees with this paddle in increments of around 10 degrees. So uh, much more customizable depending on the, the type of paddling that you like to do. Now the third type of ferrule system is a telescoping ferrule system. And what a telescoping ferrule system lets you do is it lets you change the length of the paddle. Now that's a cool feature in particular if you're someone who paddles different types of kayaks where a different paddle length is a real benefit. Or if you're someone who's going to be, who often lends their paddle to maybe their kid and they need a shorter paddle, different length paddle. Uh, that's a really nice option to have. Of course, it's also the most expensive upgrade for a paddle and it's typically only uh, an option on high end, uh, often carbon paddles. Now another shaft to consider is a bent shaft. Now that's a pretty funky looking shaft there. Now the idea of the bent shaft is that when you're pulling on a stroke, you're actually not, your arm isn't going to be per, going to be straight the whole time. And so by bending the shaft so that uh, your pull, when you pull, your arm is more aligned, your wrist and your hand and your forearm are more aligned, it's going to reduce potentially some overuse injuries on the on the wrist, but more importantly, you get more power from it because you're pulling on a, in a straight line. Those kind of benefits are, they're real, they're minimal, but the bench shaft's more about preference, feel, and just overall feel. Is it, is it something you like or not? Some people, once they use a bench shaft paddle, just the way it feels in their hands, they love it and they'll never move away from it. Other people don't actually don't like it. It's really a matter of preference rather than it being a major upgrade. All right, so that's a lot of information about paddle blades and shafts. And so you probably have the question right now of, well, what's the best paddle blade and shaft combo for me? Well, I can't really help you there. Hope I've kind of done all I can do is give you the information, but really now you have to apply your budget, your paddling style, the type of paddling that you're going to be doing and your body size uh, to all of this and decide what's the right paddle for you. But you know, if it doesn't, isn't complicated enough already, I'm going to throw some more stuff into the mix. And what we're going to talk about is one, two and four piece paddles because when you ch choose a paddle, it'll often give you the option of getting a one piece solid paddle, a two piece that breaks down in the middle or a four piece paddle that breaks into four parts. Now, why? Why, what's the benefit of each? Well, a one piece paddle, you eliminate any play, potential play at a connection point. And so it's, it's an ideal paddle 
for, for that purpose. It's also, you reduce any extra weight that's in, that uh, is a result of the ferrule system, the connection system in the paddle. The downside is you've got this 200 to 250 centimeter paddle to move around with. You can't break it down. And so that's why two-piece paddles are the most popular types of kayak paddles now. Now, the benefit of two-piece paddles is that they can be broken down. With a quality ferrule system, you basically eliminate any play between the two halves of the paddle. And so, as a general rule, that's what most people should go for. Now, the joy of, of a four-piece paddle is that it breaks down so small, this will fit into luggage. So if you're flying somewhere with your kayak paddle, this is the best option. That's the reason I have four-piece paddles is for flying with my kayak paddle because I don't always fly with a kayak. Actually, very rarely anymore would I even consider flying. I'll get a kayak, rent a kayak where I'm going, but the paddle, it's, you know, it's my paddle. <laughs> I don't want to use someone else's paddle or a lesser paddle. I want to use my paddle. And so I get a four-piece paddle to do that. Now, the downside of a four-piece paddle, I'll put the sucker together, is you have four connection points instead of just, or sorry, three connection points instead of just one. And typically the connection point here where the blade goes into the shaft, you don't want to have three of these locking ferrule systems. That's a lot of extra weight and expense to have that. And you don't need this to be at the end to be variable. You just need to have one locking ferrule system that allows different twists. So this is typically just a snap button attachment. What happens when you, with a snap button attachment is you get a little bit of play. Um, you have the potential of it getting freezing up and if you in rusting, if you're using it in salt water. So there is that downside. I would really only consider a four-piece paddle if I plan on doing some flying with it. Next thing to talk about, something I referred to earlier in this video is the twist of the paddle or the feather of the paddle, which refers to the angle of the paddle blades rel relative to each other. Now, you can paddle with a paddle with zero twist, zero offset, which means the blades are in line with each other, or you could go as much as 90 degrees so that they're offset by 90 degrees. Uh, the reason for paddling with a, or, uh, with a paddle with offset is as I am taking one stroke, that other blade is slicing through the air. There's very little wind resistance. In particular, on a windy day, that's nice to have. That top blade is not getting pushed back. You're not pushing a lot of air as you take a stroke. So it is a more efficient stroke. So if you paddled in really windy conditions all the time, this is a, uh, paddling with a twist would not be a bad idea. What level of twist? Well, that's really just a personal preference. Myself, I've gravitated over the years towards a zero feather, no twist paddle. And the reason I use that no twist paddle is because first I move towards it for whitewater because for a variety of high level whitewater kayaking moves, it's nice not to have any feather in the blades. And then I just started using that. I didn't like bouncing around with different feathers and I started using this for sea kayaking, for all the types of paddling I did. And I didn't really, it didn't bother me. I didn't have, unless you're paddling in really strong winds, it's not that big of a deal. And it's certainly more intuitive to use a zero degree or no feather paddle. So. Is, it, is there a right and wrong? Absolutely not. It's 100% personal preference. If you're just starting out paddling, I would recommend go with the zero degree twist. There's not really too much reason to do anything but that. Are you sick of hearing about paddles yet? Well, I'm almost there. Couple of last things, drip rings. That's what this thing is right here. The idea of the drip ring, so that you know, is that after you take a stroke, you water's, on your blade and you go for your next stroke, that water runs down the blade, hits the drip ring, and then drips off outside of your kayak. And more importantly, it doesn't just come down to your hand, run down your arm, your armpit, and down your side, and you get that cold water shock that sucks. So that's the purpose 
of drip rings. I typically, as a rule, I'll put them about a hand's width away from the blades. If you have them in too close to the blade, well, when you take a stroke, some of your shaft, you'll still get some water on this side and some water will, you'll get that dreaded drip down the arm. So there you go. That's what these drip rings are for. And once you've decided on your primary paddle, something to consider is a backup paddle. And that's not necessary for everybody, but a backup paddle is, uh, really becomes a necessity when you're paddling in a place where if your paddle were to fail, you'd basically be screwed. If you're dealing with open water paddling, if you're dealing, you're paddling in exposed or remote uh, places on a multi-day trip, having a backup paddle is just a smart thing to do. Otherwise you're gonna, hopefully you keep the, the broken paddle or the part of the paddle, at least the functional part of the paddle, you're gonna have to basically canoe style paddle your way out of the location. And if you're going any major distance, that's just not a reasonable option. And if you're dealing with rough water, that's a real hazard. So if you're dealing with rough water, if you're, if you're traveling in, in exposed conditions or going far out where you can't just pull out, you should have a backup paddle. And that backup paddle it doesn't need to be a high-end paddle like your primary paddle. Like your primary paddle doesn't need to be high-end either, but it should be something that you count on, something that you feel confident and comfortable with. And so that's again, a pers very personal thing. But a backup paddle in remote, exposed, rough conditions is in many cases as important as a lot of your other or any of your other safety gear. Now last but not least is how to care for your paddle so your paddle doesn't end up a broken paddle. There's a couple of ways that most people end up breaking a paddle. The biggest way is pushing off the ground. These paddles are not designed to, for force up the blade. So if you push off things straight off the blade, you're asking for problems. A lot of times what people will do is when they're launching, they'll plant the paddle and off and push themselves forward. Well, when you do that, this blade can easily snap forward or back, even you know qual high quality blades. They're just not designed for force in that way. It's very rare that you pa actually break a paddle when you're just taking a stroke. If that does happen, then it usually was a paddle blade that was already, or a shaft that was already broken. It was already cracked by doing something stupid like pushing, using it as a push pull. Sometimes you have to do that, but just be very careful and don't do it that hard. The other way people can damage their paddle is when it's traveling. It's in two pieces. They might throw it into the back seat or somewhere in their car and they close the car door and boom, it hits the ends here of the paddle. Sometimes the paddle blades themselves and that can easily crack the shaft. Again, it's not designed for that to get to absorb impact in that direction. So make sure that when you put in your vehicle, it, the paddle is clear before you shut your door. Another maintenance issue with paddles is the snap button ferrule. Uh, if you're paddling in salt water in particular, it can rust up and it can even get locked in place. So if you paddle in salt water, break it apart, give it a good rinse out, and you'll avoid those kinds of headaches. Well, there you go. That's a whole lot of information about paddles. Hopefully that helps you choose the right paddle for your type of paddling. If you came here, hoping to learn about how to properly use a paddle. Well, <laughs> good news and bad news. The, the, the bad news is we're not gonna talk about that right now. The good news is I did that video recently and I will leave a link in the description box down below to the how to paddle a, uh, a kayak properly video. Otherwise, thanks for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and if you did, please, Subscribe to Paddle TV if you haven't already and stay tuned for lots more paddling tips, gear reviews, and paddling adventures. And please leave a comment down below if you have any questions, uh, concerns, thoughts, uh, anything that I didn't cover. Just get that discussion going in the comment section down below. We'll see you soon.